Wildflower meadows are some of the best habitats for insects like butterflies, moths and bees. Yet in the UK we have lost around 98% of our lowland flower rich meadows. This film features some of the exciting projects which are creating and maintaining wildflower meadows to help insects. First we'll hear about the Helping Hands for Butterflies project in central Scotland which is making meadows in urban parks. Then we'll hear from the Scottish Wildlife Trust in Ayrshire through their Nectar Network which is working on a really great scale. Then we'll hear from Dr Phil Sterling about making rove verges better for wildflowers and for wildlife. And then finally we'll hear from the On the Verge project in Stirling about working with the local council and with schools. This first presentation is on how to create and maintain urban meadows for butterflies. I'm Anthony McCluskey, the Helping Hands for Butterflies project officer and I work with Butterfly Conservation. The Helping Hands for Butterflies project is a three-year project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and by NatureScot. And Butterfly Conservation is a UK-wide charity. We were founded in 1968 with a mission to conserve butterflies, moths and our environment. We undertake that work in a number of important ways, including technical, practical conservation action, promoting the scientific study of butterflies and moths, safeguarding the most important sites and helping the public to enjoy the wonderful world of butterflies and moths. And the work that butterfly conservation does is so important because during the last century, four species of butterfly and over 50 species of moth have become extinct in the UK. And that was most recently summarised in our State of UK Butterflies 2015 report, which found that three quarters of butterfly species had declined in their range or their abundance over the previous 40 years. And we know that moths are declining as well. This was most recently summarised in our State of Britain's Larger Moths 2021 report, which found that the abundance of moths in standardised traps has reduced by about a third in 50 years. Then when it comes to conserving butterflies and moths, many of us do it because of their enormous intrinsic value. We think that they're beautiful insects and they deserve to be conserved just for their own right. They've also got a great educational role to play and we can connect children and young people with the wider environment by showing them the wonderful diversity of butterflies and moths. They're also incredibly important in ecosystems, especially for the food webs, and they're important in the diets of certain insectivorous birds and bats. And they're just good for our mental and physical health. Getting outside on a sunny day to look for insects really does improve your mental well-being. And they are also important pollinators of certain wildflowers. For example, this butterfly orchid can only be pollinated by certain species of moth, which fly at the right time of year and have a long enough proboscis to get inside to reach the nectar. So because of these declines and because of the important role that butterflies and moths play, we wanted to do work to help them in urban areas in central Scotland. So the Helping Hands for Butterflies project had a goal to create meadows in nine parks in urban areas in central Scotland. This work was funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and by NatureScot. And we worked in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Hamilton, Blantyre and Kirkintilloch to create these nine new urban meadows. And to do that, we worked with local authorities from Glasgow City Council, City of Edinburgh, South Lanarkshire and East Dumbartonshire Councils. So let's have a look at the work that was done. And we start off by looking at what a meadow actually is. Now, wildflower meadows are essentially human creations. They've traditionally been associated with low intensity farming, a type of farming which has declined. This usually involves light grazing by animals or a single hay cut per year in late summer with no artificial fertilizer or pesticides added. But this gives us an opportunity in urban areas because since they're created by humans anyway, there's essentially no rule book, especially in urban parks and in gardens yet we can still optimise their use for different types of insects. So the sites that we started with were all typical of amenity grass areas of parks. They had little or almost no biodiversity. They were essentially just one or two species of grass in most cases. And we set about with a three year plan to increase the diversity of plants and insects in these areas. This would involve a few main elements and included cutting, where the council would cut the grass and volunteers and I would lift it and remove it off the site. We would sow, so we would sow certain wildflower seeds, especially yellow rattle and other wildflowers. And then we would plant, so we were planting wildflower plug plants and I'll describe each of these steps in greater detail in coming slides. 
So this is what our three year plan looked like. In year one, in autumn and winter, the work would be done to cut and remove the grass from the site. And then we would sow yellow rattle only. Then in year two, again, during autumn and winter, which is the best time for meadow creation work, we would have it cut and removed again. And at this stage, we were planting wildflower plugs as well, because the yellow rattle would sow itself back in, into the soil. And then year, year three was a repeat of year two. So starting off at looking at cutting and removing, why do we do this? First of all, the growth of tall grasses can suppress the lower growing wildflowers. So if we let the grass just grow, it really would be detrimental to the lower growing wildflowers, which are trying to get started. And vigorous grass growth is promoted by high levels of nitrogen in the soil. So if the grass was cut and then left to rot, it would add a lot of nitrogen back into the soil. So the grass would grow even bigger the following year. So we had a process where the grass was cut mostly by the local authorities, and then we would come along with volunteers and we would lift the grass. This can help break the cycle, reducing the amount of nitrogen in the soil and therefore allowing some of those lower growing wildflowers to flourish. And some of the sites we were able to strim them intensively as well. So we had strimmers and we had volunteers from the conservation volunteers come to help us do that work. So you can see that it is important to remove the grass from the site. Fortunately, some councils are now buying cut and collect machinery, which will make the whole process much easier. But in our case, we were using volunteers for every step in the process. So we would work with the council to have them cut the grass in autumn. We would then leave it for a few days in order for it to dry out and make it much easier to handle. Then we would rake it up into these one ton bags. Using these bags then, we dragged the grass to man-made woodlands on the same site most of these woodlands had very little flora underneath them. So by putting the grass there, we weren't going to be doing any ecosystem damage to those woodlands. On some sites, we were also able to use the green waste collection organized by the council as well. I also mentioned yellow rattle before, and yellow rattle is a native wildflower, also known as the meadow maker, because it's very often used in meadow creation projects, such as this one. This wildflower is a parasite of grass roots and it takes nutrients and water from grass, making it much weaker and allowing other wildflowers to thrive. So we sowed it in the first year of the project because by suppressing the grass, we could allow other wildflowers to grow when we planted them. Now with the yellow rattle, it is important that it is sown in autumn as this plant requires a cool period in order for the seeds to germinate. And it's very easy to sow. This is a photograph of the volunteers working at Stonefield Park in Blantyre. And at this site and all the others, we simply used grass rakes to disturb the surface of the soil. By disturbing the surface, we would expose some soil and we would simply sow the yellow rattle seeds on top of it, and then we would trample them in. It's important that the seeds aren't buried very deeply. And this is the effect of yellow rattle. You can see clearly on the left hand side where the yellow rattle has been sown. There's almost no grass growing there and where it is growing, it isn't very vigorous at all. So you can very clearly see the effect that yellow rattle has and why it's so important in projects like this. And we also undertook some seeding and planting through the project. In years two and three, we mostly used wildflower plugs and we also sowed some wildflower seeds, but this was relatively patchy. The reason behind this is because occasionally some of the local authority staff did have some spare wildflower seeds, which they could give us for the project, but we weren't relying upon those. We were really relying upon the wildflower plug method. And this was chosen because almost all of the sites were vegetated and grassy to begin with. And there really isn't any point in sowing seeds onto grass because they won't do well at all. We found that the best wildflower plugs for this project were things like knapweed, field scabious, yarrow, red clover, birds with trefoil, oxide daisy, and some of the vetches, because these were the strongest plants which were able to overcome the grasses which were still at the sites. And the top tip for this is do not use small wildflower plugs if you can avoid it. If you can only buy them when they're small, I'd recommend growing them on for about six months um, in pots until they're bigger. This is because they have a much better chance in competing with the existing grasses if they are larger plants when you put them in the ground. And also at this stage, just a warning to do some surveys of the sites before you begin work, because there might be already be a lot of existing diversity and it just needs a change in management for those wildflowers to begin to thrive. 
This is one of the sites we were working on at Springburn Park in Glasgow. And whenever we did surveys before the project began, I noticed that there were lots of leaves of orchids which were in the sward, but those orchids just never had a chance to flower. So through this project and the relaxed uh, mowing regimes that were brought in through this project, thousands of orchids were able to thrive here. So these that you can see in the photo are northern marsh orchids, and there are thousands of common spotted orchids here as well. So this site already had some diversity, which really just needed a chance to thrive. And what we did through the project then was we did sow some yellow rattle to allow some of these wildflowers to come through, but we also planted some appropriate wildflowers which liked damp sites. So we planted valerian, ragged robin and red clover, just really to increase the diversity of the site a bit further. So now let's have a look at what we can plant to help butterflies in Scotland. And first of all, it's worth saying that the larvae of all butterflies and moths eat parts of plants, usually the leaves, roots or seeds. And some of them can be very specific. You'll see the common blue caterpillar in the photograph there. And the common blue will mostly lay its eggs upon bird's foot trefoil, and the caterpillars of this species look just like the plants that they're feeding upon. Yet other species are quite generalist. So now let's have a closer look at what the butterfly caterpillars of Scotland eat and consider whether we can grow them in meadows. This poster shows all the butterfly species known to breed in Scotland, and we can go through them one by one to see which of them we can help by planting urban meadows. We'll start off with the first group. These are the Vanessid butterflies. The caterpillars of all of these species eat nettles, except for the painted ladies, and they mostly eat creeping thistles. So we can take those out of consideration because we won't be planting nettles in our meadows. Then the next group are the fritillaries. These are mostly habitat specialists. These, the caterpillars of these all eat violets, except for the marsh fritillary, which is quite a rare butterfly. So in general, we won't be expecting to see these in our urban meadows, so we can discount those as well. Next, we'll consider the brown butterflies and caterpillars of these species all eat various types of grasses. And we can keep in some of the common ones like ringlet, meadow brown and speckled wood, but we'll remove the grayling, which is quite a habitat specialist species, being mostly found at the coast and in disturbed sites like quarries. We'll also remove the scotch argus, which is also a habitat specialist, then also the mountain ringlet, which is found in mountainous areas, and the large heath, which is mostly found on peat bogs. That leaves us with five species, three of which are very widespread. Then there's the small heath, which is fairly local, but also relatively widespread. And then the wall butterfly is one which is dramatically increasing along the east coast of Scotland and slowly moving up the west coast as well. So depending on where you are in the country, you might expect to see different species of butterfly. Then with the white butterflies, the caterpillars of all of these eat plants within the brassica family. Of those, the small white, green veined white and orange tip caterpillars mostly eat wildflowers within that family, whereas the large white is mostly associated with allotments and gardens. So we're less likely to find it in our meadows breeding and we're much more likely to see the small white, green veined white and orange tips there. Then with the next group of butterflies, they're called the Lysenids. The caterpillars of these eat a huge range of plants between the different species. Now, first of all, we'll have to take out the hair streaks because caterpillars of these in Scotland mostly eat trees and shrubs, so they're not suitable for meadows. Then with the blue butterflies, the one we're most likely to get will be the common blue butterfly. That's because the holly blue is mostly associated with holly and ivy. And in Scotland, the small blue butterfly is quite rare and a habitat specialist. So the one we can keep in is the common blue. Sticking with the Lysenid butterflies, we have the northern brown argus, which is a habitat specialist butterfly. So it's not one we're going to get in most urban meadows. But we'll keep in the small copper. This is a fairly widespread butterfly species and the caterpillars of this eat common sorrel, sheep sorrel and docken. So it's one that we could be getting in our urban meadows. Then with the skipper butterflies, we have five different species in Scotland. The dingy skipper and checkered skipper are both quite rare and localised, so we can take those out of consideration. Then with the orange coloured skippers, the first one of those is the Essex skipper. It's quite rare in Scotland, so you're not likely to find it in most places, leaving us with this small and large skipper. The small is increasing rapidly and now moving through large parts of central Scotland, whereas the large skipper is increasing more slowly but we'll keep both of them in because they have similar habitat needs. So that leaves us with potentially 12 breeding species at best if we're only using typical meadow plants. 
And it's important to realize that seven out of 12 of those have caterpillars which only eat grass. So we can have a closer look at the various needs of caterpillars of all of these species now. And we'll start off by looking at the caterpillar food plants of some of the brown butterflies. And some of the very common and vigorous grasses are actually caterpillar food for these brown butterflies. This includes grasses like coxfoot, Yorkshire fog, false broom, common couch and bent grasses. Yet you're unlikely to need to plant any of these if you're working in an existing grassy area in an urban site. That's because they're all fairly widespread. But do include finer leaved grasses such as fescues and bent grasses in your mixes. This is because they can be used by caterpillars of the small heath. And it's important to include these in your seed mixes because they also interact better with wildflowers and they don't become so dense and they allow a lot more light in to get to those lower growing wildflowers. It's important to note then what caterpillars of these species do during the winter time. And caterpillars of most brown butterflies usually go to the base of plants in the autumn and they won't resume feeding until springtime. That means that you can cut your meadow in autumn time without having to worry about the caterpillars of these species getting destroyed. Staying with the butterflies whose caterpillars eat grasses, we'll now look at some of these orange coloured skippers. And the small and large skipper caterpillars eat tall grasses like Yorkshire fog and coxfoot, but it's a bit more complicated with these species, and that's because the caterpillars actually live within the upright stems throughout the winter. So if you're cutting all of your meadow in autumn or winter time, you'll be destroying the next generation of this butterfly. So it's important to leave some upright through the winter in order for this butterfly to be able to breed at your site. Now on to some of the Lysenid butterflies. We'll look at the small copper and common blue. And it's worth noting that both of these species prefer sunny sites, which are sheltered from the wind with fairly short vegetation. The small copper then has a very strong preference for places with some bare ground or rocks to bask upon. In urban areas, you'll often find it at derelict sites or on south facing sunny hillsides. Small copper can use docken, which grows as a weed in many sites. However, it's important to include common sorrel in your seed mixes as the caterpillars of this butterfly prefer this plant. Then looking at the common blue, caterpillars of this species will mostly eat common bird's foot trefoil, but it will also eat greater bird's foot trefoil. However, greater bird's foot trefoil does prefer wetter sites, so the most important plant for this species in most urban meadows will be common bird's foot trefoil. And then just looking at what these butterflies do during the winter time, they remain as caterpillars through the winter and they'll go to the base of the plants in the autumn but will feed throughout part of September. So if you're cutting your meadow in autumn time you should be okay and you shouldn't worry too much about the fate of these butterflies so long as you're not cutting it right down to the very base of the ground. Then looking at the white butterflies in meadows the best plant for them in Scotland would be cuckoo flower which is also known as lady smock and you can see it in the photograph there. This wildflower blooms in springtime and the caterpillars of species like the orange tip will actually eat the seed pods and the flowers themselves. And other species like the green veined white and small white will also eat the leaves. Green veined white and small white also have a second brood in late summer. So overall, the white butterflies do require a wider range of plants, yet not all of these are suitable for meadows. So many of the other caterpillar food plants of these species are more associated with the damp places like riverbanks, such as large bittercress, or hedgerows and woodland edges, such as garlic mustard, hedge mustard, wild cabbage and charlock, so they're not often found in meadows. So if you're planting for white butterflies, it's best done in damper areas where cuckoo flower and large bittercress can grow well. Now that we've had a look at some of the caterpillar food plants, we should also consider nectar rich plants for the adult butterflies. And I recommend tall plants which can compete with the vigorous grasses around them. So things like meadow cranesbill, common knapweed, which is in the photograph there, red campion, field scabious and oxide daisy, all of which are very good at competing with the grasses around them. And also scrambling plants which have tendrils and they can use these to climb over the grasses. These include bush vetch, common vetch, tufted vetch and meadow vetchling. And then there are some plants which are very tough and can not grow very tall but can still hold their own among the grasses. This includes red clover and yarrow. So it is very important to include these plants in your seed mixes or any work that you're doing in order to feed these adult butterflies. These can be planted as plug plants or seeded in. Plug plants are a really good way to work in established grassy areas, and I'll be talking a bit more about that later on. Then what about moths? So in the UK, there are two and a half thousand species of moth. 
and urban meadows are actually likely to have more species of moth than they are to have butterfly species, simply because there are so many species of moth. Some of those which are likely to get in areas dominated by grass include species like the large yellow underwing, some of the grass moths, dark arches and antler moth. Then if you plant common bird's foot trefoil, which is used by the common blue butterfly, you might also expect then to see the six spot burnet moth and narrow bordered five spot burnet moth. And you can also plant bed straws, which can be used by species like the common carpet moth. Now we can have a look at how the Helping Hands for Butterflies project progressed. So breeding butterflies were found at all but one of the nine new meadows. There were over 50 species of plant found between the different sites and over three acres of new habitat for butterflies, moths and other insects have been created throughout these sites. And the number of these is increasing each year. And this is just a selection of some of the photographs showing you the variety of different plants which are found in these meadows now. And we'll have a closer look at some of those in coming slides. And this is an example of one of the sites. This is Elder Park in Glasgow. And this is quite a large site that we were given to work on. So we decided to break it up into four small ovals. And we decided to work more intensively within these ovals because we didn't have enough time or money to work across the entire site here. And at this site, you can really see the impact of the yellow rattle. On the left hand side of this photo, you'll see the yellow rattle and there's much less long lush grass in it. And on the right hand side, you'll see that there was no yellow rattle planted there. So this is why we worked intensively within these ovals, really to have a strong impact in certain parts of the site. And the wildflowers that were planted around this yellow rattle took really well. You can see some bird's foot trefoil in the photograph here. And overall, this site has a lot of flowers in it. Um, and it performed very well on the floral diversity front. Here's some red clover as well, blooming at a different time of year. Yet despite all of this, there were not many butterfly species found at this site. I saw some nectaring, but those were species which are unlikely to be breeding here. And this might be explained because of the location. Elder Park is surrounded by a lot of urban sites. There aren't many other very large parks nearby or places where butterflies could come and colonize this site from. So unfortunately, despite the floristic diversity here, we didn't get many butterflies actually visiting and breeding on this site. But then at the other end of the scale, this is a park called Springburn Park in the north of Glasgow. And here we were again given a very large site to work on. And within the first year, we had a large number of different butterfly species breeding there. First of all, we saw the small heath, then there was the meadow brown and the ringlet, all of which will be laying their eggs upon grasses in this meadow area. Then we also had the green faint white, small white and orange tip, because this is quite a damp meadow, so cuckoo flower was growing well here, and therefore these butterflies were able to breed at this site. So it was one of the more successful urban meadow sites in Glasgow. And this can also be partly explained by the location, because Springburn Park is surrounded by other large parks and semi-natural sites nearby. So in this area of Glasgow, it might be the case that simply more butterflies were able to colonize the site very quickly, whereas in Elder Park, those opportunities were restricted. So it's just a reminder to choose your site carefully, and hopefully you'll get some more butterfly species arriving and breeding there. Now let's have a look at Stonefield Park in Blantyre. And this is one of the first events that we did to create meadows in South Lanarkshire. And whenever we started working on this site, it looked just like the rest of the park because it was cut more than 12 times per year. So there was very little wildlife here. So we started off like this and we raked the soil and we sowed the yellow rattle. And the yellow rattle performed really well in the first year. And huge parts of the site were simply covered in yellow rattle. Yet overall, it remained quite grassy and some of the other wildflowers really struggled to get going simply because that grass is so vigorous. Yet in the summertime, it looked very attractive. You could see the grass blowing in the wind. And within two years, we had meadow brown butterflies breeding at this site. So simply by providing this long grass, we were able to accommodate these meadow browns and hopefully they'll soon be joined by ringlet, small heath and hopefully speckled wood as well. The most successful site of all, though, was Silvernoise Park in Edinburgh. There are at least 12 species of butterfly breeding here now, and it's by far the best site within this project. There are those butterflies whose caterpillars feed upon grasses, including those brown butterflies and the small skipper. Then there are the white butterflies, and they're finding opportunities to lay their eggs on some of the woodlands nearby. 
And then there are those nettle loving species, including red admiral, peacock and small tortoiseshell, because there are some very large patches of nettles at the edges of the meadow here. And then finally, there's a the small copper. So we can have a closer look at what we did at Silver Noise and how you can replicate that at some of your sites that you're working on. Now let's have a look at what's special about the Silver Noise site. Well, first of all, there's woodland around most edges of it. So the site itself is quite sunny and exposed to the sunlight, uh, but it's surrounded on all sides by woodland and hedges. This creates a nice warm microclimate that the butterflies really enjoy. But then within the center of that, you can see that the wildflowers have plenty of room and light to thrive. But the woodland then also allows non-meadow plants to thrive, and this really attracts those white butterflies. For example, garlic mustard can be seen around the edges, whereas it's not found in the centre of the meadow itself. Then there's nettles. So there are some areas which are dominated by nettles. Those aren't spreading too much, so we're not very concerned about them. And of course, they provide food for the caterpillars of several butterfly species. The site is also very well connected to other habitat nearby. So in this area of North Edinburgh, there are other semi-natural sites nearby where butterflies can colonize, and that might have explained the success of this site also. And this video will give you a sense of what the Silver Noise site looks like, and you can see some of the patches of nettles with then some wildflowers along the sides and an area of long grass in the middle. This is where most of those brown butterflies are found. And then you can also see the woodlands, which provide that lovely warm microclimate at this site. And it's important to realise that these sites can be really good for other invertebrates as well, including some of those that we hadn't planted for specifically. Now, I was collecting yellow rattle seeds in a net, and whenever I looked inside the net, I could see that the inside were just full of different types of invertebrates. Lots of things like plant bugs here, and there were some larvae of sawflies living in the meadows, just really to illustrate the point that these meadows can really support a huge diversity of different invertebrate life. Staying on that theme then, I realised that all of my meadows had common green grasshoppers after just two years of being established. All of them also had really large numbers of ladybirds and a huge diversity of true bugs. And there were various parasitic wasps which also made their home in these meadows. Again, illustrating the point that even though we were planting primarily for butterflies and moths, lots of other wildlife could thrive in these urban meadows and they created real oases within these urban communities. And here's just an example of the new ecosystem which is developing at the Stonefield Park in Blantyre. This is one of the sites which is mostly dominated by grasses. And when I visited in the summertime, I saw lots of these uh, large wasps flying around. This is one of the parasitic wasps. And one of the favourite foods of this species are caterpillars of the large yellow underwing. Large yellow underwings will mostly feed upon vigorous grasses which are found at this site and the wasps will come along and lay their eggs within the caterpillars of the species. However, not all of the caterpillars died this way, and when I visited the meadow later in summer, I did see large yellow underwing adults flying around. So just illustrating that there is a new balance being found, and this site is providing a whole host of different opportunities for different types of insect here. We also recorded various types of bees using the meadows, and eight different species of bumblebee were recorded in these new meadows. It also included various solitary bees, at least six different species, but identification of those can be difficult. And now I have just a few slides showing some of the diversity of the meadow sites which were created through this project. So one of the most common queries I get around meadow maintenance is should you cut the entire site each year? And I would say that after you've established the site and whenever you realise it's becoming more floristically diverse, you can become a bit more relaxed with the maintenance. I think it's a good idea to leave a third of the, on the site uncut each year, as some invertebrates will remain on upright stems through the winter, such as those small skippers which live as caterpillars inside the stems. So by splitting the site up into thirds and cutting them on a rotational basis, that means that each third would then be cut twice in every three years. And it's important to know that the caterpillars of some species will go to the bases of plants. And so when you are cutting it, you can leave the blades a bit higher, such as 10 centimetres or more, to avoid killing those. Then how do you dispose of the cut grass? It depends on your situation, but for this project, we were able to distribute it under small trees and hedges where there were no wildflowers growing nearby. 
And for the management, the sites, uh, once they're established, only need to be cut about one time per year. So in this case, the council cuts and we were collecting them. So that cut is best done in autumn and then the material lifted off then as well. And for ongoing management, it's important that these sites are maintained into the future. And for this project, we're working with community groups and friends of park groups, which will take the sites on in years to come. And for seed mixes, then we recommend uh, different seed mixes. So if you've got a site with bare soil, the Scotia Seeds Urban Pollinator Mix is a very good one. This includes 21 different wildflowers and six grasses, but do look at others to suit your site conditions and adapt as needed. For example, if you've got a damp site, then you'll need a wet meadow mix. And don't forget to include birds with trefoil and common sorrel in your seed mixes. And timing of the work is really important. In this project, I was asking the councils to cut the meadows from mid-September mid onwards, and we would collect the grasses a few days later. This allows the grass to dry out, to dry out, so it's much easier to pick up, and it also allows some of the wildflower seeds to drop back into the soil as well. And I only ever plant wildflower plugs or sow seeds in the autumn. That's really from September to November, or you can also do it in March. You should never plant wildflower seed seeds or plugs after March, as they will very likely die from drought, because even if they get a week without rain, those plants can die off. So by planting them in autumn, you're much more likely to have successful wildflower plugs. And then how deep to sow or plant? Now, I would say that most wildflower seeds only need covered very lightly. You need to sow them, then rake or trample them in, but just make sure they have a very good contact with the soil and don't leave them on the surface. And if you're using wildflower plugs, I'd recommend planting those one to two centimetres below the ground surface, um, and you should really try to heal them in. That's where you use your boots uh, to really make sure that they get a very good contact with the soil so that they're held in the soil very well because birds will often pull them out. And just to say it doesn't always go to plan, so cutting can happen at the wrong time of year sometimes, especially if you're working in parks which are maintained by different staff members that happen multiple times through the project. But as soon as we found out each time, we came to rake off the cut material so that it didn't rot and go back into the soil. And the sites do recover well, um, and it can even help in establishing a wildflower meadow because the grasses are also being cut as well. And some of those low growing wildflower, uh, wildflowers might not be cut and they'll get a better chance to thrive. This is one of the sites in Granton Crescent in Edinburgh. And about a month after being cut, you can see that it's beginning to thrive again and those wildflowers were coming back. So it's not all lost if everything is cut at the wrong time of year. And it's also important that you choose your site carefully as well. There are some plants which are negative indicators. So if you see these plants, it might be a sign that the site is unsuitable for a wildflower meadow because the soil is just naturally too rich. Plants such as nettles, creeping thistle and docken will indicate that to you. And also aspect is important too. We know that butterflies prefer the sunny sites, ideally with some shelter from the wind, as we saw with the silver noise site. So a perfect site would be one with native trees uh, around the edges, which can offer some protection from the wind, while also giving some access to the sunlight and warmth that the butterflies need. And if you're struggling to find a site on which to create a wildflower meadow, you could be planting some of our common native trees. This is because the caterpillars of these moths feed upon these trees. And so if the site isn't suitable, then consider some trees that will encourage species like the poplar hawk moth, buff tip moth, and to the canary shouldered thorn. And this is our list of trees and shrubs that are very good for moth caterpillars. Those on the left also have flowers that adult butterflies and moths as well as insects like bees can feed from. So just to say thanks once again to the National Lottery Heritage Fund and NatureScot for funding the Helping Hands for Butterflies project and for the local authorities from Glasgow City Council, City of Edinburgh, South Lanarkshire and East Dumbartonshire Council for making their land available and for making staff time available to help with this project. And a final thank you to everyone who's been involved in the Helping Hands for Butterflies project and helped to create these nine new urban meadows around Scotland. And now I'm delighted to introduce Lynn Bates from the Scottish Wildlife Trust, who's been working on a huge scale in Ayrshire to create fantastic meadows for insects.
Hello everyone, uh, my name is Lynn Bates, I'm the Net to Network Coordinator and um, I'd just like to go through a few slides and explain a little bit about what the Net to Network is, uh, what we've been doing and uh, talk a little bit more about um, the meadows that we've been creating in the last couple of years. So um, the Net to Network is a partnership of individuals, businesses, golf courses, uh, local authorities, landowners, schools, anyone really who's uh, who wants to um, do things to help pollinators can can join and become a partner. It's led by the Scottish Wildlife Trust, and we do have a small steering group um, of partners, uh, as well as our current funders that sit sit on the steering group. So, what what are our aims? Well. Um, Fairly simple, really. Uh, our aims are to connect nectar and pollen rich sites along the Ayrshire coast. That might be already existing sites um, that we have that are already um, already good for, for pollinators, but it's also about uh, filling in the gaps, uh, either creating new meadows or bringing old ones back into to management. Uh, we also want to create a network, not just of physical on the ground sites, but of partners and people uh, to really build the network and enable our pollinating insects to grow and thrive. So it all started in about 2013. Uh, there was a group of local um, businesses based in Irvine in North Ayrshire and Gurvin in South Ayrshire, and they were working together looking at various sustainability issues. And uh, once that finished, they decided to, well, what else can we do? We're working together as a good wee group. So they decided to try and help pollinators. So that has been going since about 2013. But in November 2019, we um, managed to secure funding through Nature Scott. Um, so they were very kind to fund us for the next two and a half years, as well as some funding from a couple other golfing charities. And um, the aim of that funding in that in, in that first phase was really to increase the number of sites and raise the pro profile of the project and develop new partnerships. That finished earlier this year in March, but we've just been um, awarded another um, year and a half of funding through Nature Scott. So that means we can continue uh, to build on what we've done. So those of you who aren't aware of uh, where where we are along the Ayrshire coast, so southwest of Glasgow, you can see this gives you a rough idea. So Irvine is in North Ayrshire, we're at the top of those um, red little um, icons, and Girvin is just peeking out at the very bottom uh, below Turnbury. So going through uh, both authorities, North Ayrshire and South Ayrshire, we do have to put a limit on it. So we go to about five kilometres um, inland and the whole length of that area is about about 80 kilometres. So if you zoom in a little bit on some of the on the site, so this is on our website, um, our Scottish Wildlife Trust website, we have our own nectar network um, area within there. And if you zoom in, this is North Ayrshire, so you can see Irvine uh, towards the top of that map. Uh, click on one of the, the wee site maps and uh, icons and it gives you a rough idea of what's going on, just the site name, the partner and a little bit about that site. So at the moment we have about 47 sites. Um, that equates to about, well, over 30 hectares and roughly 26 partners. Obviously, some of the bigger partners like the authorities or businesses or, or ourselves um, have several sites. We've, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've got funding for the next two years and um, we aim to increase um, what we have at the moment, add another 36 new sites plus um, increase that to, to over 15 hectares. So fairly straightforward, fairly simple. Um, if you want to become a partner, um, we really uh, ask you only to really sign up to do three things. If you have a small area or a large area, it really doesn't matter. It's all about managing the site for the uh, for the benefit of pollinating insects. We also uh, want you to think about the health and well-being um, of the pollinators when you're managing the site. So we're, we're not into people spraying. You know, you're you're really about about managing that whole site um, with pollinators in mind. And also, obviously, while you're at it, if you can talk to neighbours, friends, other businesses, whoever you are, to try and encourage them to, to raise awareness and promote the Nectar Network so we can increase that connectivity along the Ayrshire coast. 
and there's a couple of pictures there um you get a, a when you sign up and you you you're doing things for pollinators we give you a wee um outside uh, plaque you can put up as well as window stickers things like that so we have been making lots of um, um, areas for pollinators, improving lots of sites along the coast. There's a few pictures here of roadside verges, of community groups, um, various um, rangers, uh, junior rangers. There's lots of lots of different groups and people involved. And these are some of our, our uh, smaller sites, so anything from a few 20, 30 square metres uh, up to several hundred um, square metres. So that these, these smaller sites have all been uh, prepared and um, enhanced using uh, basically people power, rakes, trimmers, lawn mowers, petrol scarifiers, uh, lots of hard work getting in there and preparing the sites uh, and sowing the sites. Uh, but what I want to focus on really um, um, during this session is, is looking at some of the, the bigger sites that we've been making. So back in September 2020, um, we managed to um, to find a couple of sites that we really wanted to try and, and, and um, experiment with some so half a hectare um, so 5,000 square meters um, sites that we could um, bring in some um, equipment to be able to to make bigger sites but with the idea that uh, we'd be experimenting different methods of preparation and also experimenting using green hay and we were doing this with in partnership with North Ayrshire Council. So the pictures here are of uh, two different sites on Irving Beach Park. The site on the left, we call this the pond meadow. Um, obviously, you can see the, the meadow, uh, sorry, the pond there. And um, this area is cut regularly by the council. Uh, it's amenity grassland. It's in a very uh, conspicuous place. You can see the path running along. Um, the site on the right, we call this the Dragon Meadow. Either side of the path, it's um, uh, about half a hectare in total, either side of the path, and it's slightly out, slightly further out of the way, but still very much obvious, and a lot of people um, walk around this area. So we wanted to experiment with how we could take this regularly cut amenity grassland, make it into a meadow, um, reduce the amount of cutting, grass cutting that the, the council would then have to do. So we were anticipating just doing a one end of year cut back end of the summer. Um, it would obviously help pollinators. It would in, increase the um, the number, the amount of forage available, but also improve the site for, for visitors. So we got to work um, the following month, October 2020, we scarified hard the dragon meadow area we 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 had um a tractor run over it do lots and lots of scarifying really hard to get through this this thick thatch this grass that had just been cut and left to fall and become ve a very thick uh, sward and but eventually we got it to an uh, to a, a sort of a uh, to a, a position that we were felt fairly happy to sow with so then we did direct sowed and we're using um, Scotia seed, so we're using Scottish wildflower seed, uh, and we're sowing just just wildflower seed, no no grass uh, in this mix to begin with. We then went over to the next site, the pond meadow. We started to scarify this site, and again, it, we were finding it really hard to get through that thick thatch um, of grass. So we made it the, the decision to plow. So we plowed and then leveled this site. Uh, run it over with a scarifier to, to make it nice and level. Uh, so we have two very different sites in the preparation. Both both um, sowed with exactly the same seed mix, uh, a wildflower seed mix, and uh, we put up a couple of signs there. So you can see either end of each meadow, there was a couple of signs we put up just to inform people, to make obviously people aware. One thing on signs uh, while we're there, we... we, we um, we were very keen to obviously to show people what we're doing, but we're also very aware that this, this, these sites, the beach park is used a lot by people. So those signs actually only 
uh, lasted a few weeks before they started getting a little bit bashed and damaged. So over the next year, those signs have probably been replaced about five or six times. But it did its job in the um, in the first few weeks to show people. So moving on to the first summer. So that was July 2021. So that's the pond meadow. And um, um, we were really pleased with with the with the pond meadow that first summer because you can see in the foreground lots of yellow rattle came up. So that's that's on the area just outside of where where we ploughed. We scarified it hard, realised it wasn't working. We weren't getting right through that thick sward. So we we sowed the seed, the wildflower seed and the yellow rattle. So you can see the yellow rattle in the foreground and behind there is uh, all the wildflower seed. And this started flowering probably from early July, um, late June, early July, and it went right through um, into early September, mid-September. This is it in August, still flowering, still really, really species rich there. Maybe we, I think in the first year we, we recorded at least 16, 18 um, different uh, plant species and absolutely buzzing, uh, really busy with not only bees, butterflies, solitary bees, hoverflies. So, so we were really pleased with that. However, the dragon meadow. Um, early on in the spring, we could see lots of this, lots of yellow rattle growing. So we were really pleased about that. Um, but very few flowers came. Uh, so remember, the dragon meadow was the one we just scarified. Scarified it hard, but uh, but that year we had a basically a meadow, a yellow a yellow rattle meadow, which I wasn't at all worried about because you could see there were lots of uh, perennial flowers starting to grow amongst there but a lot of people just would walk past the dragon meadow and you would see just very low growing yellow flowers but but we were just thinking just wait wait to see what comes the following year we had our fingers crossed over that so because we were so happy with the pond meadow and so were the council so they were really pleased that it had a, a big impact. We had lots of people uh, talking about it, lots of feedback, lots of good social media posts. They agreed uh, to allow us to extend the Dragon Meadow. So we we always had in the back of our mind if we if we could extend, we'd extend this meadow, which continued around around the corner, another half a hectare that we prepared that um, that following that autumn in October 21. So we prepared it. We then sowed the area on the left with um, our Nectar Network wildflower mix and the area at the back on the right there, we used green hay. So we wanted to experiment in, um, using green hay. So we cut the pond meadow that had been nice and flowery all summer. We went in, cut it, raked it up with a with a hay rake here, picked it up, put it into the um, into a muck spreader and we trundled it over the hill off to the right and spread it out the muck spreader over the um, over the, the new dragon extension area. So we used the seed, the green hay from here uh, to experiment to see if we could make that work. So the following summer, this is what uh, we were hoping for after the yellow rattle had been. So this is the original dragon meadow, which the year before had just been full of yellow rattle but with lots of these perennial flowers that we could see uh, were starting to grow basil leaves and it really did come good so it took two years for this for this meadow to really uh, get to um, get to the species richness but it was really uh, it was really worth waiting for so that that was fantastic what happened with our yellow with our um, green hay was that also worked really well so you can see in the picture there there's that's where we 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 shot out the back of the muck spreader the green hay and it just it really took off we had lots of uh, annuals growing there early on but then as it as the season as the summer this summer just developed it changed and more of the perennials came through so we were really pleased that that uh, that was our first experiment with with green hay going back to the Pond Meadow, so this is its second year now, 
Um, so this was May 22 this year. So this is its second year. And because it's had that second season, it's coming into its second year. All those uh, perennials that had established last year are already starting to flower. So this is mid-May and you can see already there's lots of flowers in there. And the other thing we realise is having monitored it, it be it's becoming much more species rich. There's far more. There's probably now 20, 22, 24 um, different um, plant species there. And again, we're having regular pollinator um, surveys done by our volunteers. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops. So from mid-May, it started flowering right through July, right through to um, end, of, end of August, early September. Um, so this is this was has been really successful. We've been really pleased with it and it's been uh, a real showy meadow and it's been pure wildflower seed. Um, but at the same time, we've uh, and we've and that's be, um, enabled us to really get a good buy in uh, from from the council and from people, local people. But we also want to make some more traditional what we would call traditional meadows um, in other areas around Irvine. So this is this is our um, uh, our one of our wildlife reserves at the back there and the trees. That's that's um, Lawthorn Wildlife Reserve and the area in the front here, the grassy area. Again, it's council-owned land. It's 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 amenity grassland. Again, it's cut regularly, and there's a path going right through the middle of this grassy area. And this was an area, another half a hectare that the council were keen to for us to look at and and help explore ways to to reduce the cutting, but also make it. A bit more species rich, so we we prepared this site and um, got it all ready to uh, sow direct. And again, in, um, we ploughed this site because having had the experience of scarifying and ploughing, um, we wanted this to 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 basically uh, work very quickly. But also, uh, we were sowing a. Um, grass and flower seed mix here. So again, using Scotia seed, we wanted we we had a Mavis bank mix. So 80% of this mix was grass with 20% flowers. We also put some yellow rattle in there as well, and um, we did two sites: Surly Wood and um, Lawthorn Wood Meadow. And this was Surly Wood Meadow this this summer. So this is its first flowering and again really pleased with this very different much more of a traditional meadow um, look to it obviously there's grass in there some very fine grasses so again pleased with pleased with this result so we experimented to see how that would work but also we we're looking at costs because obviously we need to always be thinking about we're in, we're increasing the number of um, meadows we're making we're increasing um, making at least another 15 hectares in the next couple of years. So we need to look at ways of, of how we can do that with the, and the costs involved. And just to just to show you an up to date of what we did just a couple of weeks ago. So early September, this is showing you uh, the pond meadow back at Irving Beach Park. So picture on the left is is uh, our contractors cutting the meadow. So it's it was just starting to go over. We cut it um, in one day. We we cut but all the meadows that day, but also the few days before we prepared four new meadows. So we we prepared uh, four half hectare sites. So we have another two hectares that were ready prepared, um, ready to to take the green hay. So having cut the meadow that that morning, we then raked it all up, put it in the back of the muck spreader so you can see that. And that's the top picture on the right is the muck spreader going along, uh, shooting out the green hay and it, it chops it up a little bit. It makes it quite fine so then it can run around the, the bare soil you can see in the foreground and, um, and, and spreading it out. It then uh, we then take a roller. We have a roller on the back of another tractor, and that rolls it a few times just to just to push it down to make um, good seed to soil contact. So that's that's been now two years of making 
um, of the meadows growing and then taking the seed, the green hay from those meadows and making more meadows. And we're looking at having taken about one, one, one and a half hectares of cut green hay from, from the meadows. And we've made another two hectares. So they, they people talk about me, it's roughly one to three ratio. We found with, with this, this autumn, it wasn't quite that it was just a little bit less that the green hay wasn't spreading as far so so that's what we've learned so far and just to look at the last couple of slides really to show you some of the costs involved and why um why you maybe um you could think about using green hay so costs for sowing so so obviously the, a one hectare is a you know ten thousand Square meters is a large area, but we we can work out. I can work out on uh, on hectares how much it's costing then, and, and and scale that up or down. So cost for sowing one hectare. So just the wildflower seed alone, if you if, if you're sowing a hectare, will cost you four thousand four hundred uh, pounds. Yellow rattle. Uh, if you're adding yellow rattle to that, you're looking at another two thousand three hundred. So just for the seed alone, for a hectare, it's 6,700. If you're using a mix of grass and wildflower seed, then that's obviously a lot cheaper. Instead of 220 pounds a kilo, you're looking at 77 pounds a kilo. These are rough figures, obviously depending on where you get it from. You need slightly more um, to because it's it's more grass than than wildflower seed. So the sowing rate is is about thirty kilos for a hectare, as opposed to just flower uh, wildflower seed being twenty kilos. So just for grass and wildflower seed, you're looking at two thousand three hundred. Some sites you may want to add yellow rattle to to that, depending on how you're preparing uh, the site. So obviously the yellow rattle will help to, to keep any um, any grasses, particular thuggish grasses down. So if you want to add yellow rattle to that, you're looking at another 2,300. So, you know, you're looking at saving a couple of thousand pounds per hectare. Then obviously on top of that, you need to add the costs for preparing the site and sowing the site. And again, that depends on how you're preparing, what you're going to do, are you just going to hard scarify? Are you going to use a um, uh, a, um, a flail mower and collector? I mean, there's lots of different ways to make meadows. So, so you, again, you need to add on. Uh, so you're looking at least seven and a half thousand or five and a half thousand to make a hectare. If you compare that with using your green hay, so if you already have a, an existing meadow, or you can go to a donor site and and collect some green hay cut it and collect it then obviously it's much cheaper so using green hay to sow one hectare it's costing us approximately 600 pounds to prepare the initial site so we found a site we want to prepare that get get it ready for the green hay and then to go and cut and collect spread the green hay um, it's costing us to in total about 1300 so a huge saving there you can see um, if you've got the ability to to get some green hay and and to use it locally obviously when you're cutting green hay you need to use it fairly quickly um, we were doing everything uh, on the same day cutting and moving it and spreading it and obviously you know if, you, if you're getting it from too far away you've got to think about well is that you know, if that that seed, if that green hay is sitting about too long, it's it's going to become less viable. It, it can heat up. So uh, it's like when you cut your grass, if you leave it sitting there, it starts to heat up, especially if it's a bit damp. So you need to think about um, the logistics and, and where exactly and how far. But it's definitely something to think about. So our next um, thing we'll be looking at is possibly seed harvesting and how we can actually go in to a site and collect at different times of the year seed because obviously when we're using the green hay we're just cutting it once at the back end of the year at the back end of the summer we're cutting and lifting that meadow that would be cut and lifted anyway and we're taking that and spreading it but the seeds we're getting are obviously uh, maybe limited 
it may be not getting the earlier flowering seeds. So we're, we're going to investigate and do some trials on on um, on uh, harvesting earlier in the year using um, seed harvesters. So to finish off, uh, a few takeaway lessons from from the things we've learnt um, in the last um, three years. People always say, "Well, how how can I how can I do it? Um, what what you know? We're we're wanting to do things, and I would say the biggest thing is to find the people, um, find the right people to make it happen. You can have whatever policies or strategies or plans, whatever you know, whether you're a, a, an authority, or, um, agencies, groups, whatever you know, you can have as many plans and policies, but it's actually putting those. Uh, putting those plans into action and that's what people do. People make those things happen. So it's finding the right people within that organisation, group, whatever community to make it happen. And they are out there. Choose your site carefully if you have a choice, if you can. If it's looking at various sites, make sure you're looking at a site that really um, is going to be successful but it's not going to take years and years and lots of money to to enhance. So you're looking at your positive indicators. You're looking to make sure there's no things like lots of nettles and um, docks and uh, creeping thistles, things that are really going to take a, lot, a long time, if at all, to get rid of. So choose your site carefully. Make sure you do good ground preparation. So at least 50 percent uh, bare ground before you even so you need to be thinking about really getting opening up that sward so that you get good seed contact and consider using green hay it's definitely you know we're not even not not on the scale necessarily that we're doing it at but if there's a meadow nearby and you can go in uh, at the back end of the year cut it or collect some seed as things start to um to dry and and uh, have gone over then you know really think about it um it's it's a really good way of of using local seed and and passing that on and moving the next meadow and definitely the right time to make a meadow is now okay we we couldn't make them 20 30 40 years ago we're, we're too late when making meadows now and if you've made one definitely think about making another one okay thank you and now we're going to hear from my colleague, Dr. Phil Sterling, on how we can make row verges better places for wildflowers and for insects. Hello, I'm Phil Sterling, and uh, I work at Butterfly Conservation on the Building Sites for Butterflies programme. My um, background is that I was at uh, Dorset County Council in Dorset in southern England um, for 25 years. And over that period, learned a lot about large scale developments and how to restore biodiversity as part of the green infrastructure, as part of the soft landscape that was created as part of those developments. And for the last four years of my tenure, I was um, put in charge of the whole of the Green Space Service, Green Space Management Service, which included the management of road verges and for the first time had the opportunity to put into practice on a big scale across the county the change to the management of road verges and parks and open spaces that really sets out to uh, improve the biodiversity of the grasslands which in previous decades had simply been blown to death. So looking at the first slide, um, here's an example of one of the road verges I created on the Weymouth Relief Road, which year on year looks absolutely fantastic and full of wildflowers. And my project at Butterfly Conservation is very much to uh, transport this uh, experience that I've had over many years to, to, to others, to learn from the practice that um, I established while I was uh, at the County Council. So here's a photo of some typical urban grasslands. By and large, our current practice is that we um, mow grasslands far, far too frequently. Um, so we end up with lawns that are 
almost devoid of wildflowers. And in a local authority context on the right hand side, when budgets get cut, the grass still needs to be mown. And when it does get mown, it looks very untidy. You end up with this brown rotting mess of grass on the surface and that absolutely smothers any possibility of more diverse uh, wildflowers within those grasslands. So we definitely need to do better than we are currently. And it's absolutely true, probably wherever you are, that most urban grasslands pour in wildflowers and pour in pollinators. So we've got this huge resource. Um, the current estimates are about 41% of all urban land is green space. Now, much of that is residential gardens, and we can all do better, those of us who own gardens. But road verges, over 4%, and parks and open spaces, over 7% of that, of, of, of that area is perfectly capable of supporting much more biodiversity, if only we let it. And, <clears throat> and there are good reasons for doing this. We want wildflowers and insects in our in our lives they bring joy to us as well as all sorts of other ecosystem service benefits but currently we're locked into this very regular cyclical maintenance system our rural verges uh, road verges tend to get mown what, two or three times a year and in urban spaces urban verges they can be mown anything between five and 22 times a year and 22 times it, it is a ridiculous amount of mowing. It's not needed. And so I asked myself when I was put in charge of the service, are there smarter solutions to cutting grass that so that we can deliver more wildlife, do so more cheaply in a more carbon friendly way, and yet still leave those grasslands looking tidy so that we don't get too many complaints and also help engage with communities? And of course, the answer to that is yes. And it's all down to the grassland ecosystem. Um, soil fertility in a grassland ecosystem is the key here because the higher the fertility, the more the grass grows, the lower the fertility, the less it grows. And so these two photos show uh, same road verge, just 100 metres apart down in Weymouth and Dorset. On the left hand side where my ex colleagues in the engineering section uh, restored a new verge by placing the standard 150 millimetres of topsoil on top of whatever they'd created, sowed it with amenity grass and then handed it on to the maintenance department to look after. On the right hand side, they'd kind of run out of topsoil, so they just made good what they had, sowed the same uh, um, amenity mix and, and left it. And you can see instantly where the fertility is high on the left, the grass is growing vigorously, in early spring and it already needs cutting in order to maintain the, uh, the, the sight lines. But on the right, still performing the same green space function. This is not a rough old verge, it's a nice green looking verge, but it doesn't need mowing at all. And not only that, you can see on the right hand side, it's full already of common wildflowers, daisies and dandelions. But on the left hand side, tall grasses, coarse grasses tend to uh, choke out any wildflower. And so that's the system we're dealing with. If we reduce fertility, we increase wildflower. And if we look at the way that our um, most diverse grassland ecosystems in this country, and indeed across the whole of Northern Europe, how they run, we see exactly the same, is that the greatest plant diversity is in those areas where the soil fertility is least. So that could be the limestone dales, sand dunes, upland hay meadows. Anywhere where that fertility is low, you tend to get higher plant diversity. And so we need to copy that system in our urban development. We need to create grasslands which have got high amounts of environmental stress, low nitrogen, and we need to manage our existing grasslands to reduce and not increase nitrogen. The best example that I've got is um, I was on an engineering project team to be able to uh, help out with the um, creation of the soft estate of the verges and the uh, landscape around the Weymouth Relief Road back in 2009. And I specified that the verges should have either no topsoil at all, as in the wildflower seed would be sown directly onto bare mineral or, or subsoils, 
or just a very light scatter of maybe 15 mil of topsoil over some of the verges. And the, and the seed mix is on, on the right hand side, a simple mix suitable for southern England, and most of those species will also grow elsewhere in Scotland and, uh, and around the country, um, but some of those might be um, more specific. Um, but, but most of these would grow almost anywhere given poor soil fertility. And look at the effect. Just two seasons later, the first of the major wildflowers to come up, kidney vetch, has just blossomed on this bare ground. And that's what that species likes. Um, it's a pioneer species, I call them. There are a couple, two or three of them. Uh, kidney vetch, common birds, but trefoil and, um, and oxide daisy. They're probably the ones that I would always include in mixes where we're going to put them on bare ground because they flourish so well. Kidney vetch, probably the best of all of those lot. And it's really important for the small blue butterfly, which has become much rarer these days because we don't see kidney vetch in our landscape anywhere near as much as we used to. But if you come down to Weymouth, you'll see kidney vetch everywhere these days. It's become a standard wildflower of our verges because it spreads so easily once that soil fertility is down. And guess what? Small blue populations are now huge. Certainly on these relief road cuttings, probably the largest population of small blue in southwestern England. And that's all created within 10 years. And looking at that, we're now 2022. Um, the verges, that same verge looks like this these days in the summer, absolutely carpeted with pyramidal orchids, which in this part of the country is a common orchid. But nowhere have I seen populations of hundreds of thousands of orchids as there are on these um, skeletal soil verges and lots and lots of wildflowers. 141 species at the last survey that we did. And now we've got 30 species of butterfly that have been recorded by volunteers on these verges. And all of this within 10, 12 years of the, the road being opened and the sites created, we really can bring back biodiversity into our countryside. It's, um, it, it's only a matter of getting that specification right and, and stopping ourselves from carrying out the current practice, which is just to plaster everything in topsoil, so it with grass seed, and forget about it. We can do a whole lot better. Now, one of the things that we need to consider is how we manage to retrofit low fertility to existing grasslands, because if we've got 40% of our urban land, existing urban land is open space, and a lot of its lawns or its public parks and verges, how do we reduce the fertility given that most of that will have had topsoil put on it? Well, there are things we can do. But one of the things we mustn't do is simply to stop mowing. If we do just stop mowing or reduce the frequency significantly, we end up with very tall grass. And that's because we haven't changed the fertility of the soil below. So the grass grows tall, it tends to grow some of the more competitive species, which, OK, they may well be wildflowers in one sense, but they're extremely difficult to manage. So creeping thistles, lots of ragworts, um, they, they become tricky to cope with. And the vast amount of vegetation above ground, particularly when it comes to the end of the season, almost leaves um, maintenance crews flummoxed as to what to do with this material because you end up with a lot of material, and where do you take it to? So we do have to get on top of soil fertility before we reduce the amount of mowing. And the way to do that is to go in there and start cutting and collecting that vegetation. If you allow grass to grow in the spring and the summer, before you cut it, get it as long as possible, then when you do take it away, those plants have been taking the nutrients up from the soil, the fertility up from the soil beneath and converting it into leaves and flowers and seeds during that growth period. If you take it away in a cut and collect machine, it can't go back into the soil. And if it can't go back into the soil, guess what? The grass then doesn't grow anywhere near as strongly the next time. And this system is far, far quicker than I thought it would be. And we also have the benefit of um, 
of of understanding that um, when we do this, um, that the grass really changes very very quickly. So in this slide, we can see that after three cut and collects that were carried out in one year, 2017. So that was one in April, one in July, and one in September. The following year, which is this slide here in 2018, in mid-May, this grass doesn't need cutting at all. There's no safety issue. It looks fine. And indeed, it's got lots and lots of common wildflowers. The previous year, so previous April, before we'd started the cut and collect, this was just a jumble of tall grasses, tall coarse grasses that absolutely had to be mown to maintain the sight lines and the visibility and safety. But one year later after cut and collect, the fertility has been so reduced that the grass no longer grows as tall. It's fantastic. It's such a quick system. and We need to do it. And if we think about it from an agricultural point of view, no farmer in their right mind would take three hay crops off a, a field without improving the fertility of that field first. But that's exactly what we want to do in our amenity areas. We absolutely want to get that fertility down. We're not trying to get a crop off here. We're trying to get wildflowers and a nicer environment for people. And so after four years of cut and collect um, in Weymouth, here's a, a verge that's on clay soils just above Sainsbury's. And, and next to the railway line. So it's, no, it's nowhere in particular in, in the town. And almost all the verges that are now on cut and collect look like this. They're full of wildflowers in the spring. And notice too that the height of these wildflowers is, is very low. They're what, perhaps eight, 10 inches tall, maybe a foot tall. No way is any of that vegetation causing an issue of safety sight lines. So we can have all these wildflowers and we can maintain the safety of the highway. So these verges are genuinely now providing highways for pollinators. So we've created these linear networks of common wildflowers across all the road verges in Weymouth. And uh, here's the same verge a year later, um, just, just showing that, yes, the, the wildflowers, they may differ each year, but overall you've created a system that is pretty sustainable, is that those wildflowers are not going to get any taller year on year. If anything, they'll get shorter year on year. So full of wildflowers and notice hardly any grasses is that in this system, as you reduce the fertility of the soil, you reduce the dominance of grasses and you start getting a more balance between grass and, and herbs and wildflowers. Now, once you're in control of the cut and collect and the, and the, and the soil fertility, you can manipulate that how you like. So here's um, an example of uh, lawns outside uh, social housing in Weymouth. And this is on a normally about a five cut and collect system each year. And over the summer months, there's genuinely no need to be cutting that grass. It doesn't need it from a from a, a visual perspective. Nobody needs to see any tidier grass than that. But because the fertility is reduced, we end up with um, lots of common wildflowers being able to thrive in these lawns if the mowing is relaxed, say, between I don't know, end of June and, and, and mid-August. Mid so there's lots of um, hawkweeds and common birds with trefoils and clovers, including the rare species strawberry clover that grows in this particular lawn. So um, some lovely flowery environments, very neat and tidy, but uh, certainly providing uh, good access and good lots of pollen and nectar for bees and, and uh, common birds with trefoil as a food plant for common blue butterfly. Now, we've also in, in Weymouth um, on some of the more, um, I suppose, verges that were created from agricultural land. So these were agricultural soils where we wouldn't necessarily expect seed bank to be present within the soil. Um, we've undertaken our harsh cut and collect system three times in one year. And then the, that autumn, we've sown those areas with a basic wildflower mix of, of yellow rattle and oxide daisy, common birds foot trefoil and, and common knapweed. 18 months later, we've got a fine showing of wildflowers coming up and all of these areas which were once gang mown areas of grassland have now become little pocket nature reserves. But notice how also next to the footways and roadways, we've also created 
what we'd call a sort of um, a frame around these these meadow areas so that they do look like they're purposefully being left as wildflower areas where the bits next to the roadways and the footways are neatly mown uh, with a, a metre wide edge. Now, disposal of arisings is always an issue. Of what, what do you do with the arisings? Um, uh, and, and we'd love to be able to say, look, couldn't we use these as a product and take them to, to, to compost and be useful? And that is a possibility. But certainly when we started in Dorset, um, we simply found areas on the existing road verge where we could tip the arisings on the principle of you need to be able to dispose of those arisings as close to where they are cut as possible. And in that way, you don't waste fuel in moving them to any, any further than you absolutely have to. And if you find sensible places for that, you can, there are, and there are thousands of them on the, on the road network, then if you put them into new areas of planting or existing uh, copses of trees, then that fertility that you've picked up in the, in, in the grass, that can be used to help grow the trees and the shrubs. And effectively that material gets converted into above and below ground carbon, which is exactly what we want to do. So we, so we can think of um, our, our grassland uh, ecosystems on the road verges as, as being ones where we can shift the nutrients around and put them where we want them and remove them from where we don't want them. So this is quite a good system to use. But there are other options, and certainly in Lincolnshire, they have been trialling uh, verge harvesting um, as a means uh, of, of creating um, biogas for, for domestic consumption. And um, with that and composting operations, um, there are op opportunities for, for using road verge arisings much more fruitfully than simply hiding them away. But even when you do hide them away, if you hide them away in relatively small piles, those piles disappear in six months and a year later you'd be hard pressed to know where they are. So actually you don't end up with this mess of heaps of grass everywhere. If, you, if, if, if the staff undertaking or the contractors undertaking the work are careful, you do end up with um, uh, uh, it, uh, nobody really noticing the change other than the more wildflowers. Now in Dorset, we've managed to get to, to, to a situation where we've measured the difference, we've measured the benefits. And in North Dorset, um, where the, the uh, uh, verge cutting teams um, uh, last, well, they started their trials in 2018. So the last cut and drop was in 2017. And the verges used to be cut five or six times a year in the urban areas, in the towns and the villages. They used to start in March and end in mid-October, and there was a three-man team that went out there. One person on the mower, one person strimming around the street furniture and as a, as a banksman to check for safety, and the, another person who was there with the leaf blower to blow the grass off the pavement and out of the drain and the roadways back onto the verge, where, of course, the grass cuttings then just rot and grow more grass the following year. And they used to spend a lot of time doing that. Effectively, the teams would be out between, between March and October, and that's all they would do would be to mow grass. These days, um, uh, we, when we look at the amount of mowing that's required, basically the cycle for urban verges is two or possibly three times a year is a cut and collect. That's all that's required these days because the fertility of the verges are reduced. That has resulted in the teams not having to go out and start their cutting rounds until the end of May, and then they finish again at mid-October. But the team size is reduced because when you cut and collect, you no longer need the person who is on the leaf blower because there's nothing to blow. So you can reduce the staff team size from three to two. So they only do cut, collect and string. And even accounting for a little bit of extra time that's required in terms of disposing the grass. The numbers of days that the teams are out there cutting grass has, has fallen by over half. And when we look at the calculation on staff savings, it's, it's just under 70% of staff resource that's been saved. And of course, we haven't yet calculated how much fuel and other savings uh, um, uh, are being accrued in doing so. So this is a remarkable system. 
and that not only can we deliver more wildflowers, but we can do so at considerably reduced cost. And that's because we're working with the grain of nature. We understand the grassland ecosystem that we're trying to manage and working with that grain of nature to help us on our way. So in conclusion, that's it. If we look at amenity grassland as an ecosystem, we really can change the way we do the day job. Uh, and that can be on highways. It can be in specifying um, how grass is cut or how it's uh, how it's um, created in planning so that we get specifications right for new housing developments and indeed in existing parks and verges. Um, however, they're managed by swapping from a cut and drop to a cut and collect system. We can hugely save save money and and we can also involve the community in this because who wouldn't like a lot of wildflowers on their verges and understanding that we're after low fertility is key to increasing biodiversity and it will not only that it will make it cheaper it will contribute to carbon reduction by using less fuel and almost certainly the more diverse the species are within a grassland the more carbon that can be sequestered in the soil beneath. So this is a very carbon friendly approach to open space management. And finally, why wouldn't we want to do this? You know, being walking around Weymouth these days, people, a lot of people are really pleased to see and to enjoy the mass of orchids that there are on the roads these days. And all of this you know, wasn't like that before. It was either mown grassland or they were complaining because the mown grass had been cut and it was it was lying on there and looking brown and horrible. It can be different and this is a really good way of doing it. Thank you. And now we're going to hear from Lee Biaggi, who has been making some fantastic meadows for pollinators in Stirling as part of the On The Verge project. So about 12 years ago, I was standing in my kitchen making packed lunches, listening to the radio, and I heard Dave Goulson talking. He's one of our foremost bumblebee experts in this country. And he was talking about declining pollinator populations, which was something I was sort of aware of, I'd, I'd seen for myself in my own garden. And he said a very key phrase. He said, several species of bumblebee had already gone extinct and others were on the verge of extinction. And I thought, oh, on the verge, that would make a really good name for a bee project. Somebody should definitely do that. And by the end of the day, I hadn't been able to stop thinking about it and had a sort of idea of how it might work. So I mentioned it to a friend who was already working in the environmental sector. She thought it was a good idea. We got a group together. And that's how On the Verge came about. We didn't really know how to go about starting, really. All we knew was that we wanted to get a good geographic spread of sites throughout Stirling. And so we decided to contact schools and community groups initially because that would give us that geographic spread. I was a bit worried that nobody would be very interested in it, but it turned out that lots of people were interested. And in the first year, we signed up seven schools and five community groups. Um, but before we could get the seed into the ground, we had a lot of things to work out. We had to work out how we would pay for it. Turns out if you ask local businesses for money, they give it to you. Well, they did 10 years, 12 years ago. I don't know if they would now. So we got money from local businesses to buy the seed, which was great. We had to work out what kind of seed we were going to sow. Um, we consulted with the Bumblebee Conservation Trust and with our local biodiversity officer and with Scotia Seed. And that's where we buy our seed now. And we developed the On The Verge seed mix. It's a mixture of annuals and perennials. So that solved that problem. Then we had to work out how we could get the sites prepared. The, the type of sites we were looking at were mostly short managed turf in parks or in school grounds where nothing was ever going to grow because it was cut multiple times a year. But it needed to be deturfed, rotivated and dug over and raked out. So that's quite a lot of work for schools or community groups to take on. Luckily, somebody put me in touch with the Criminal Justice Service. Now they're called unpaid volunteers and most um, towns and cities will have that service. And they came out and prepared the sites for us, which was fantastic. So that ticked that box. Um, so eventually we were ready to go into the schools and with the community groups and, and help support the sowing and, and get all the seed into the ground. The other part of the the sort of jigsaw puzzle, puzzle that we wanted to, the final piece to put together, was getting the local authority involved. We wanted Stirling Council 
to uh, show support of the project and do some sewing of their own. We didn't want them to do a big area, just something somewhere quite visible where um, people would see what was going on and, and it would raise awareness. I wasn't very hopeful that we get a positive response, but went in nevertheless to talk to the council. But the person I met was very interested, very keen, and asked the biodiversity officer to identify 25 sites around Stirling. And in that first year, we sowed, they sewed up 25 sites, about 1,500 square metres of wildflowers themselves. So that was fantastic. We did our schools and our community groups. They did the bigger sites. And then we had to just wait. And we waited for quite a long time because it was one of the coldest, driest uh, springs that I can remember for a very long time. And nothing happened for months. And we thought the whole thing had failed. However, summer eventually arrived and the flowers came with it and everybody was happy and we were in business. And since then, things have kind of evolved quite a lot. We, um, we tend to sew up two types of areas. We'll look at uh, short managed turf, as I mentioned, in schools and on playgrounds and, and um, parks. We also found that after a few years of being around, people would get to hear about us and they would contact us and say, oh, they put in lots of paths in such and such a place. Could you go in and sow up wildflowers instead of the grass before the council? So we would, so we decided then also that we would look at infrastructure works where bare soil had been left after construction. So we now do that. We check with the council to see that they're all right with that. And they generally say yes, because then they don't have to go in and sell the grass seed. And we go in and sell wildflower seeds. And that can be quite effective. Um, so those are the two sites that we generally look at sowing. Although there is a third option, which I'll talk about shortly, that we, we also have um, newly arrived at that we prefer. There have been two main challenges that have arisen with the project over the years. Uh, the first one that used to trouble me quite a lot, but doesn't bother us very much anymore, is you, you can never tell what's going to happen when you sow the seed into the ground. It's, it's very unpredictable. So sometimes there'll be an area that you think is absolutely surefire, definitely going to work, perfect, sunny, open, not too much vigorous vegetation around, and nothing happens and you just don't understand why. Or other sites where we've thrown seed in and thought that's never going to work, and it does. So it's extremely unpredictable. Often we might get a poor show with the annuals because we sow up um, an annual perennial mix. A very small component of the seed mix is annual and the bulk of it is perennial. And sometimes the annuals will do really well and the perennials will be very slow to get going. Sometimes the annuals don't do well at all and the perennials get going much faster. Sometimes you get both working really well. So the unpredictability we're much more relaxed about now. Generally, in most areas we've sown something into, something happens at some point, but nature does its thing and you just have to let it do that. The second challenge is a bit more of a challenge and that's around public acceptance of the aesthetic. Um, people like the idea of wildflowers, but sometimes the reality is a bit more challenging. The annuals are very popular and they're very pretty, very compact. We sow in, I think there's four species in the annual mix, um, corn marigolds, um, mayweed poppies and um, cornflowers. And it's very pretty and quite well behaved. The perennials, of which are about 20 species in the mix, are quite wild looking at points in the year because they are <laughs> in fact wildflowers. And often people can perceive them as a bit messy. So we're very careful about where we would sow in the mix. If it's anywhere where the visual impact is very important, we might not suggest the perennials, we might just put in some annuals. We like to tuck them away where nobody's going to really bother about them, but they just sit there quite happily doing their thing. Um, so we've learned that over the years to be quite careful where we cite the perennials. But we do need to persuade people to love the perennials because they do offer much greater value for pollinators. And in 2014, we had some research done for us by a student at Stirling University. And her um, research on our wildflower site showed that the perennial sites, that's uh, older than a year, two years and more, were uh, attracted 50 times more pollinator species, uh, more pollinators than short managed grass, and a lot more than the annuals even. And this is because the, um, the perennials 
have a much wider range of flower shapes, so they appeal to a wider range of pollinators. It's like a pick and mix for pollinators. And the annuals have a very similar uh, flower shape that appeals to possibly more short-tongued bees than long-tongued bees, and certainly not the bumblebees quite so much. So we need people to love those perennials and just to get used to the their local environments looking a bit different. Um, I think neat and tidy has had its day. So. We're working on that second challenge and slowly, slowly we are sort of breaking it down. Um, in 2019, uh, we had a sort of a bit of an epiphany with On The Verge because I went to a conference and heard Dr. Phil Sterling talking of the Butterfly Conservation Organization about cut and collect. And this is a different way of managing grassland. Um, the principle behind it is that you lift the grass clippings to reduce the fertility in the soil and the grass is much less vigorous. And so the wildflowers get a, a chance to come through instead of just grass. And loads of money can be saved doing this and um, effort and time. And it's ecologically much more valuable. So this was a complete revelation to me. I've never heard about this. So I went rushing back to Sterling Council, full of the good news, saying, yes, whole new way of managing um, your grasslands. Great, isn't it? Expecting them to adopt it the very next day. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, they sort of made the right noises, but we didn't kind of go in the right direction. So in 2020, when I had much more time on my hands, we lobbied the council really hard. We got up a petition asking them to manage their grasslands in a more ecological way with cut and collect. And we um, spoke to uh, all the politicians we could manage to get hold of, MSPs, MPs, uh, local elected members, officers within the council, got the press involved. Eventually, we took a presentation to council in September of 2020, and they agreed in principle to pursue the idea of a pollinator policy for sterling. And I'm happy to say that in two years later, in November of this year, it should be voted through finally in council and become a policy for sterling, which will be absolutely fantastic. And on the back of that news, that, that knowledge that we gained from Dr. Phil Sterling, we now like to manage grassland slightly differently. There's still a, a, a place for uplifting turf in schools and sowing in new mix. Um, and certainly when there's infrastructure works, we definitely want to get in there with the wildflowers where we can. But actually managing grass with cut and collect and yellow rattle seed and managing it more naturally and incrementally and sowing in locally collected wildflower seed that, that a lot of us now are in the habit of collecting as we go about sterling. That's a much gentler, more nature friendly way of doing it, I think. It takes longer, but it involves the whole community because you need a lot of volunteer activity for that. and it doesn't cost any money. So there is a whole range of things a community can do to improve local environments for pollinators. If you've got lots of time and energy and commitment, lobby your local authority, um, get them to change their practices if they're not already doing it. And that can make a really big difference on a sort of um, wider geographic scale. If you haven't got that sort of time, then um, find a little patch of grass with your your neighbours or a, a, a local group and um, get permission to manage it for wildflowers. A bit of cut and collect, a bit of raking, a bit of cutting, a bit of sowing in of yellow rattle seed, collecting wildflower and just incrementally year on year, you'll get a much better floral diversity there on your in your street, right in front of your house if you're lucky. And, and that costs nothing but time and a little bit of com commitment and some volunteers. So there's lots of ideas that can be um, taken up. Um, and I'll tell you, the thrill of finding your first orchid and a little patch of grass that you've been managing for several years, you can't beat that. So good luck.